The first inkling that these fellows in this camp had of this coming crisis was to look up at that, at that skyline and to see a great finger of black come over the skyline at the notch. There were four and a half thousand Zulus, one and a half miles west of Isan Rona. David spoke about the battles as famous Zulu victories, not famous English defeats. And he popularized the, the great strength of Zulu culture. I mean, that's what we need in this country, is, you know, we, we're, we're swamped with cynicism and racism. David was one person I knew who wasn't. He loved people, all people, and, uh, and I think that's, that was a major part of who he was. And I think that's something he would want us to continue. We don't want any racial hatred to come of this because that would just violate everything he stood for. After David died, I was faced with a very, probably difficult choice whether to pack up and go, take the boys and go live somewhere else. But I chose to stay. When David died, a, a number of his mates got together and raised some financial support to continue the work that Nikki and David had done in developing in schools in the area. The education of these people from this impoverished area was an, a cause very close to David's heart because he firmly believed that without education there was no hope. So I was able to carry on with the help of, of the board of the David Ratray Foundation to do bigger and better projects. As I believe that um, giving more people the chance of a good education will hopefully lessen the chance of something like this happening to somebody else. In the area they live, it's called Umzinyati, a study by the Business Trust shows that there's half a million people that live there. 80% of them live on less than 20,000 rand a year, which is in poverty. 70% of the population is in their 20s or younger. And, um, you know, only 44% of people have any education. If we think we've got difficulties now, if we don't do something about it in 10 or 15 or 20 years' time, it's going to get much worse. And we have to start somewhere. Hello. We visited the local schools. A number of our board members got together and went with a chief and a local businessman and had a look at, on the ground to see what, what the needs were. It's very rural, there are large distances. Um, the physical infrastructure was um, uh, dilapidated in many cases. There are a couple of schools that need to be rebuilt. If I was to categorize um, the, you know, the general issues were learner and teacher commitment, lack of access to nutrition, sanitation, running water, and, um, and security. Basics, absolute basics. A lot of time and effort is, is focused around tuition, maths and science extra lessons, for example, because um, you know, there's such a dearth of, of qualified learners in that area. But if a student's walked 20 k's to school and uh, only gets fed at 10 o'clock, the best maths teacher in the world is not going to get anything into his head. So if we can um, address those problems in a sustainable way, we believe we'll add considerably to the ability of those schools to deliver education. If we can address the basics, you'll, you'll raise the dignity of the institution. And I think we'll flow from that, we'll improve, the, the learner and teacher commitment will improve. Because if you show that you care, you know, that, that's a tremendously empowering um, concept. Then we'll ask them to apply for funding. This is not about corporates taking over the role of education. This is about partnership between corporates doing what they do well and the, and the government who will provide the teachers and, and deliver education. If we can address the basics, you'll, you'll raise the dignity of the institution. And I think we'll flow from that, we'll improve, the, the learner and teacher commitment will improve. Because if you show that you care, you know, that, that's a tremendously empowering um, concept.